Section 18 of the South Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philippa Jevons. The South Pole by Roald Amundsen. Translation by A. G. Carter. Section 18. Volume 1. Chapter 8. A Day at Framheim. Part 3. At the eastern end of the house the passage was brilliantly lighted up by the window that looked out on this side. I could now see more clearly where I was. Opposite the window, in the part of the barrier that here formed the other wall of the passage, a great hole had been dug. Nothing was to be seen in it but black darkness. My companion knew his way, so I could rely upon him, but I should have hesitated to go in there alone. The hole extended into the barrier, and finally formed a fairly large room with a vaulted roof. A spade and an axe on the floor were all I saw. What in the world was this hall used for? You see, all the ice and snow from here has gone to our water supply. So this was Lindstrom's quarry, from which he had hewn out ice and snow all these months for cooking, drinking and washing. In one of the walls, close to the floor, there was a little hole just big enough for a man to crawl through. Now, you must make yourself small and follow me. We are going to visit Hansen and Visting. And my companion disappeared like a snake into the hole. I threw myself down, quick as lightning, and followed. I would not have cared to be left alone there in pitch darkness. I managed to get hold of one of his calves, and did not let go until I saw light on the other side. The passage we crept through was equally narrow all the way, and forced one to crawl on hands and knees. Fortunately, it was not long. It ended in a fairly large, square room. A low table stood in the middle of the floor, and on it Helmer Hansen was engaged in lashing sledges. The room gave one the impression of being badly lighted, though it had a lamp and candles. On a closer examination, I found that this was due to the number of dark objects the place contained. Against one of the walls there was clothing, immense piles of skin clothing. Over this were spread blankets, to protect it from the rime that was formed on the roof and fell down. Against the opposite wall was a stack of sledges, and at the end, opposite the door, were piles of woollen underclothing. Any outfitter in Christiania might have envied this stock. Here one saw Iceland jackets, sweaters, underclothes of immense thickness and dimensions, stockings, mitts, etc. In the corner, formed by this wall and the one where the sledges stood, was the little hole by which we had entered. Beyond the sledges, in the same wall, there was a door with a curtain in front of it, and from within it came a strange humming. I was much interested to know what this might be, but had to hear first what these two had to say. What do you think of the lashings now, Hanson? Oh, they'll hold right enough. At any rate, they'll be better than they were before. Look here, how they've pointed the ends. I leaned forward to see what was wrong with the sledge lashings, and I must say what I saw surprised me. Is such a thing possible? The pointing of a lashing is a thing a sailor is very careful about. He knows that if the end is badly pointed, it does not matter how well the lashing is put on. Therefore it is an invariable rule that lashings must be pointed as carefully as possible. When I looked at this one, what do you think I saw? Why, the end of the lashing was nailed down with a little tack, such as one would use to fasten labels. That would be a nice thing to take to the pole. This final observation of Hansen's was doubtless the mildest expression of what he thought of the work. I saw how the new lashings were being put on, and I was quite ready to agree with Hansen that they would do the work. It was, by the way, no easy job, this lashing at minus fifteen degrees Fahrenheit, as the thermometer showed, but Hansen did not seem to mind it. I had heard that Visting also took part in this work, but he was not to be seen. Where could he be? My eyes involuntarily sought the curtain, behind which the humming sound was audible. I was now ready to burst with curiosity. At last the lashing question appears to be thrashed out, and my companion shows signs of moving on. He leaves his lantern and goes up to the curtain. Visting? Yes! The answer seems to come from a far distance. The humming ceases, and the curtain is thrust aside. Then I am confronted by the sight that has impressed me most of all on this eventful day. There sits Visting in the middle of the barrier, 
working a sewing machine. The temperature outside is now minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This seems to me to require some explanation. I slink through the opening to get a closer view. Then, oh, I am met by a regular tropical blast. I glance at the thermometer. It shows plus 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But how can this be? Here he is, sewing in an ice cellar at plus 50 degrees. I was told in my school days that ice melts at about plus 32 degrees. If the same law is still in operation, he ought to be sitting in a shower bath. I go right in. The sewing room is not large, about six feet each way. Besides the sewing machine, a modern treadle machine, the room contains a number of instruments, compasses and so forth, besides the large tent he is now working on. But what interests me most is the way in which he circumvents the shower bath. I see it now. It is very cleverly contrived. He has covered the roof and walls with tin and canvas, so arranged that all the melting ice goes the same way and runs into a wash tub that stands below. In this manner he collects washing water, which is such a precious commodity in these regions. Wily man! I afterwards hear that nearly all the outfit for the polar journey is being made in this little ice cabin. Well, with men like these, I don't think Amundsen will deserve any credit for reaching the pole. He ought to be thrashed if he doesn't. Now we have finished here, and must in all probability have seen everything. My guide goes over to the wall where the clothing is lying and begins to rummage in it. A clothing inspection, I say to myself. There's no great fun in that. I sit down on the pile of sledges by the opposite wall, and am going over in my mind all I have seen, when suddenly he thrusts his head forward, like a man who is going to make a dive, and disappears among the bundles of skins. I jump up and make for the piles of clothing. I am beginning to feel quite lost in this mysterious world. In my hurry I collide with Hanson's sledge which falls off the table. He looks round furiously. It is a good thing he could not see me. He looked like murder. I squeeze in between the bundles of clothing. And what do I see? Another hole in the wall, another low, dark passage. I pluck up courage and plunge in. This tunnel is rather higher than the other, and I can walk, bending double. Fortunately, the light at the other end shows up at once, so that my journey in the dark is not a long one this time. I come out into another large room of about the same size as the last, and afterwards learn that it is known as the Crystal Palace. The name is appropriate as crystals sparkle on every side. Against one wall a number of pairs of ski are resting. Elsewhere there are cases, some yellow and some black. I guess the meaning of this at once, after my visit to Stuberud. The yellow cases are the original ones, and the black the improved ones. They think of everything here. Of course, in snow, black is a far better colour than light yellow. The cases will be pleasanter to look at, and very much easier to see at a distance. And if they happen to run short of marks, all they need do will be to break up a case and make as many black marks as they want. They will be easily seen in the snow. The lids of these cases surprise me. They are no bigger than ordinary large milk-can lids, and of the same form. They are loose, as with a milk-can, and are put on in the same way. Then it suddenly occurs to me. When I was sitting on the sledges in Hansen's workshop, I noticed little pieces of wire rope fixed to both ribs of the sledge. There were eight of them on each side, just the right number. They are lashings for four cases, and they will hardly take more than that on a sledge. On one rib all the wire ropes ended in eyes, on the other they ended in thin lashings. Obviously there were four of them to each case, two forward and two aft of the lid. If these were reeved and drawn taut, the cases would be held as in a vice, and the lids could be taken off freely at any time. It was an ingenious idea which would save a lot of work. But there sits Johansen in the middle of the palace, packing. He seems to have a difficult problem to solve. He looks so profoundly thoughtful. Before him is a case half-packed, marked Sledge No. 5, Case No. 4. More singular contents I have never seen. A mixture of pemmican and sausage. I have never heard of sausages on a sledge journey. It must be something quite new. The pieces of pemmican are cylindrical in shape, about two inches high and four and three-quarter inches in diameter. When they are packed, there will be large star-shaped openings between every four of them. 
Each of these openings is filled up with the sausage, which stands straight up and down and is of exactly the height of the case. But sausage, let me see. Ah, there's a sausage with a tear in its skin. I run across and look. Oh, the cunning rascals! If it isn't milk powder they are smuggling in like this. So every bit of space is utilised. The gaps left by these round pieces of pemmican at the sides of the cases are of course only half as large as the rest, and so cannot take a milk sausage. But don't imagine that the space is wasted. No. Chocolate is broken up into small pieces and stowed in there. When all these cases are packed, they will be as full as if they were of solid wood. There is one ready packed. I must see what it contains. Biscuits. 5,400 biscuits is marked on the lid. They say that angels are specially gifted with patience, but theirs must be a trifle compared with Johansson's. There was absolutely not a fraction of an inch left in that case. The Crystal Palace at present reminds one strongly of a grocer's and chandler's store. Pemmican, biscuits, chocolate and milk sausage lie about everywhere. In the other wall, opposite the ski, there is an opening. I see my companion making for it, but this time I intend to keep an eye on him. He goes up two steps, pushes a trap door, and there he stands on the barrier. But I am there too. The trap door is replaced, and I see that we are close to another door in the barrier, but this is a modern sliding door. It leads into the clothing store. I turn to my host and give him my best thanks for the interesting circular trip through the barrier, expressing my admiration of all the fine engineering works I have seen, and so on. He cuts me short with the remark that we are not nearly done yet. He has only brought me up this way to save my having to crawl back again. We are going in now, he adds, to continue our journey under the surface. I see that there is no getting out of it, although I am beginning to have enough of these underground passages. My host seems to guess my thoughts, as he adds, We must see them now when the men are working. Afterwards they will not have the same interest. I see that he is right. Pull myself together and follow him. But fate wills it otherwise. As we come out on the barrier, Hansen is standing there with his sledge and six fresh dogs harnessed. My companion has just time to whisper to me, Jump on, I'll wait here. When the sledge starts off at a terrific pace, with me as a passenger unsuspected by Hansen. We went along so that the snow dashed over us. He had his dogs well in hand, this fellow, I could see that, but there were a wild lot of rascals he had to deal with. I heard the names of Hock and Togo in particular. They seemed inclined for mischief. All of a sudden they darted back on their companions under the traces and got the whole team in a tangle, but they were not able to do very much, as the whip, which was wielded with great dexterity, constantly sang about their ears. The two sausages I had noticed on the slope, Ring and Mylius, were leaders. They too were full of pranks, but kept their places. Hi and Rap were also in the team. Rap, whose ear was split, would have liked very much to get his friend Hi to join in a little fight with Hock and Togo, but for the whip. It swished to and fro, in and out among them without mercy, and made them behave like good boys. After us, some yards behind, came Zanko. He seemed to be put out because he had not been harnessed. Meanwhile we went at a gallop up the hill to the depot, and the last flag was passed. There was a marked difference in the daylight here now. It was eleven o'clock, and the flush of dawn had risen a good way in the sky, and was approaching the north. The numbers and marks on the cases were easily visible. Hansen drew up smartly by the rows of cases and halted. We stepped off the sledge. He stood still for a moment and looked round, then turned the sledge over with the runners in the air. I suppose he did this to prevent the dogs making off while his back was turned. Personally, I thought it was a poor safeguard. I jumped up on a case and sat there to await what developments might come. And they came in the form of Zanko. Hansen had moved off a little way with a piece of paper in his hand and seemed to be examining the cases as he went along. Zanko had now reached his friends, Ring and Mylius, and the meeting was a very cordial one on both sides. This was too much for Hock. He was on to them like a rocket, followed by his friend Togo. High and Rap never let such an opportunity escape them, and they eagerly flung themselves into the thick of the fight. Stop that, you blaggers! 
It was Hansen who threw this admonition in advance as he came rushing back. Zanko, who was free, had kept his head sufficiently to observe the approaching danger. Without much hesitation he cut away and made for Framheim with all possible speed. Whether the others missed their sixth combatant, or whether they too became aware of Hansen's threatening approach, I am unable to determine. Certain it is that they all got clear of each other, as though at a given signal, and made off the same way. The capsized sledge made no difference to them. They went like the wind over the slope, and disappeared by the flagstaff. Hansen did not take long to make up his mind, but what was the use? He went as fast as he could, no doubt, but had reached no farther than to the flagstaff, when the dogs, with the capsized sledge behind them, ran into Framheim and were stopped there. I went quietly back, well pleased with the additional experience. Down on the level I met Hansen on his way to the depot a second time. He looked extremely angry, and the way in which he used the whip did not promise well for the dogs' backs. Thanker was now harnessed in the team. On my return to Framheim I saw no one, so I slipped into the penthouse and waited for an opportunity of getting into the kitchen. This was not long in coming. Puffing and gasping like a small locomotive, Lindstrom swung in from the passage that led round the house. In his arms he again carried the big bucket full of ice, and an electric lamp hung from his mouth. In order to open the kitchen door he had only to give it a push with his knee. I slipped in. The house was empty. Now, I thought, I shall have a good chance of seeing what Lindstrom does when he is left alone. He put down the bucket of ice, and gradually filled up the water-pot which was on the fire. Then he looked at the clock. A quarter past eleven. Good. Dinner will be ready in time. He drew a long, deep sigh, then went into the room, filled and lit his pipe. Thereupon he sat down, and took up a doll that was sitting on a letter-weight. His whole face lighted up. One could see how pleased he was. He wound up the doll and put it on the table. As soon as he let it go, it began to turn somersaults, one after another, endlessly. And Lindstrom? Well, he laughed till he must have been near convulsions, crying out all the while, "'That's right, I'll have I go it again!' I then looked at the doll carefully, and it was certainly something out of the common. The head was that of an old woman, evidently a disagreeable old maid, with yellow hair, a hanging underjaw, and a lovesick expression. She wore a dress of red and white check, and when she turned head over heels, it caused, as might be expected, some disturbance of her costume. The figure, one could see, had originally been an acrobat, but these ingenious polar explorers had transformed it into this hideous shape. When the experiment was repeated, and I understood the situation, I could not help roaring too, but Lindstrom was so deeply occupied that he did not hear me. After amusing himself for about ten minutes with this, he got tired of Olafa, and put her up on the weight again. She sat there, nodding and bowing, until she was forgotten. Meanwhile Lindstrom had gone to his bunk, and was lying half in it. Now, I thought to myself, he is going to take a little nap before dinner. But no, he came out again at once, holding a tattered old pack of cards in his hand. He went back to his place, and began a quiet and serious game of patience. It did not take long, and was probably not very complicated, but it served its purpose. One could see what a pleasure it was to him, whenever a card came in its right place. Finally, all the cards were in order, he had finished the game. He sat a little while longer, enjoying the sight of the finished packs. Then he picked them all up with a sigh, and rose, mumbling, "'Yes, he'll get to the pole, that's sure, and what's more, he'll get there first. He put the cards back on the shelf in his bunk, and looked well pleased with himself. Then the process of laying the table began once more, but with far less noise than in the morning. There was nobody to be annoyed by it now. At five minutes to twelve, a big ship's bell was rung, and not long after the diners began to arrive. They did not make any elaborate toilet, but sat down to table at once. The dishes were not many. A thick black seal soup, with all manner of curious things in it. Seal meat cut into small dice is no doubt the expression, but it would be misleading here. Large dice, we had better call them, with potatoes, carrots, cabbage, turnips, peas, celery, prunes and apples. I should like to know what our cooks at home would call that dish. Two large jugs of syrup and water stood on the table. Now I had another surprise. 
I was under the impression that a dinner like this passed off in silence, but that was by no means the case here. They talked the whole time, and the conversation chiefly turned on what they had been doing during the forenoon. For dessert they had some green plums. Pipes and books soon made their appearance. By about two o'clock the boys gave fresh signs of life. I knew they were not going to work that afternoon, St. Hans' Eve, but habit is a strange thing. Bjarland rose in a peremptory fashion, and asked who was going to have the first turn. After a lot of questions and answers, it was decided that Hassel should be the first. What it was, I could not make out. I heard them talk about one or two primuses, and say that half an hour was the most one could stand, but that did not mean anything to me. I should have to stick to Hassel, who was going first. If there should be no second man, I should at any rate have seen what the first one did. Everything became quiet again. It was only in the kitchen that one could tell that the barrier was inhabited. At half-past two, Bjarland, who had been out, came in and announced that now it was all a mass of steam. I watched Hassel anxiously. Yes, this announcement seemed to put life into him. He got up and began to undress. Very strange, I thought. What can this be? I tried the Sherlock Holmes method. First, Bjarland goes out. That is fact number one. Then he comes back, that I could also make sure of. So far the method worked well, but then comes the third item. It is all a mass of steam. What in the world does that mean? The man has gone out, if not on to the barrier, then certainly into it, into snow ice, and then he comes back and says it is all a mass of steam. It seems ridiculous, absurd. I send Sherlock Holmes to the deuce, and watch Hassel with increasing excitement. If he takes any more off, I felt I was blushing and half turned my head. But there he stopped. Then he picked up a towel and away he went, out through the penthouse door. It was all I could do to follow him, along the snow tunnel in nothing but. Here steam really began to meet us, getting thicker and thicker as we came into the barrier. The tunnel became so full of steam that I could see nothing. I thought with longing of the tale of Amundsen's anorak that was so useful on such occasions, but here there was nothing to take hold of. Far away in the fog I could see a light, and made my way to it with caution. Before I knew where I was I stood at the other end of the passage, which led into a large room covered with rime, and closed overhead by a mighty dome of ice. The steam was troublesome and spoiled my view of the room. But what had become of Hassel? I could only see Bjarland. Then suddenly the fog seemed to clear for an instant, and I caught sight of a bare leg disappearing into a big black box, and a moment later I saw Hassel's smiling face on the top of the box. A shudder passed through my frame. He looked as if he had been decapitated. On further consideration, his features were too smiling. The head could not be severed from the body yet. Now the steam began to clear away little by little, and at last one could see clearly what was going on. I had to laugh. It was all very easy to understand now. But I think Sherlock Holmes would have found it a hard nut to crack if he had been set down blindfold on the Antarctic barrier, as I was, so to speak, and asked to explain the situation. It was one of those folding American vapour baths that Hassel sat in. The bathroom, which had looked so spacious and elegant in the fog, reduced itself to a little snow-hut of insignificant appearance. The steam was now collected in the bath, and one could see by the face above it that it was beginning to be warm there. The last thing I saw Bjarland do was to pump two primus lamps that were placed just under the bath up to high pressure, and then disappear. What a lesson an actor might have had in watching the face before me! It began with such a pleasant expression, well-being was written upon it in the brightest characters. Then, by degrees, the smile wore off, and gave place to seriousness. But this did not last long. There was a trembling of the nostrils, and very soon it could be clearly seen that the bath was no longer of a pleasant nature. The complexion, from being normal, had changed to an ultraviolet tint. The eyes opened wider and wider, and I was anxiously awaiting a catastrophe. It came, but in a very different form from that I had expected. Suddenly and noiselessly the bath was raised, and the steam poured out, laying a soft white curtain over what followed. I could see nothing, 
only heard that the two primuses were turned down. I think it took about five minutes for the steam to disappear. And what did I see then? Hassel, bright as a new shilling, dressed in his best for St. Hans's Eve. I availed myself of the opportunity to examine the first, and probably the only, vapour bath on the Antarctic barrier. It was, like everything else I had seen, very ingeniously contrived. The bath was a high box without bottom, and with a hole large enough for the head in the top. All the walls were double, and made of windproof material, with about an inch between for the air to circulate. This box stood on a platform which was raised a couple of feet above the snow surface. The box fitted into a groove, and was thus absolutely tight. In the platform immediately under the bath, a rectangular opening was cut, lined around with rubber packing, and into this opening a tin box fitted accurately. Under the tin box stood two primus lamps. And now everyone will be able to understand why Hassel felt warm. A block hung from the top of the hut with a rope reeved in it. One end was made fast to the upper edge of the bath, and the other went down into the bath. In this way the bather himself could raise the bath without assistance, and free himself when the heat became too great. The temperature outside the snow wall was minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Cunning lads! I afterwards heard that Bjarland and Hassel had constructed this ingenious bath. I now went back to the house, and saw how they all, almost, made use of the vapour bath. By a quarter past five all the bathing was concluded, and every one put on his furs. It was evident that they were going out. I followed the first man who left the hut. He was provided with a lantern, and indeed it was wanted. The weather had changed, a southwest wind had sprung up suddenly, and now the air was thick with snow. It was not a fall of snow, for one could see the stars in the zenith, but snow caught up by the wind and whirled along. A man had to know the surroundings well to find his way now. One had to feel. It was impossible to keep one's eyes open. I took up a position in lee of a snowdrift, and waited to see what would happen. The dogs did not seem to be inconvenienced by the change of weather. Some of them lay curled up in a ring with their nose under their tail on the snow, while others were running about. One by one the men came out. Each had a lantern in his hand. As they arrived at the place where the dogs were, each was surrounded by his team, who followed him to the tents with joyous howls. But everything did not pass off peacefully. I heard, I think it was in Bjarland's tent, a deafening noise going on, and looked in at the door. Down there, deep below the surface, they were having a warm time. All the dogs were mixed up together in one mass. Some were biting, some shrieking, some howling. In the midst of this mass of raging dogs I saw a human figure swinging around, with a bunch of dog-collars in one hand, while he dealt blows right and left with the other, and blessed to the dogs all the time. I thought of my calves, and withdrew. But the human figure that I had seen evidently won the mastery, as the noise gradually subsided and all became quiet. As each man got his dogs tied up, he went over to the meat-tent, and took a box of cut-up seal-meat which stood on the wall out of the dog's reach. This meat had been cut up earlier in the day by two men. They took it in turns, I heard. Two men had this daily duty. The dogs were then fed, and half an hour after this was done, the camp again lay as I had found it in the morning, quiet and peaceful. With a temperature of minus 65 degrees Fahrenheit, and a velocity of 22 miles an hour, the southwester swept over the barrier, and whirled the snow high into the air above Framheim, but in their tents the dogs lay full-fed and contented, and felt nothing of the storm. In the hut preparations for a feast were going on, and now one could really appreciate a good house. The change from the howling wind, the driving snow, the intense cold, and the absolute darkness was great indeed when one came in. Everything was newly washed, and the table was gaily decorated. Small Norwegian flags were everywhere, on the table and walls. The festival began at six, and all the Vikings came merrily in. Lindstrom had done his best, and that is not saying a little. I specially admired his powers and his liberality, and I think even in the short time I have observed him he has shown no signs of being stingy when he appeared with the Napoleon cakes. 
Now I must tell you that these cakes were served after every man had put away a quarter of a plum pudding. The cakes were delightful to look at, the finest puff pastry with layers of vanilla custard and cream. They made my mouth water. But the size of them! There could not be one of these mountains of cake to every man. One among them all, perhaps, if they could be expected to eat Napoleon cakes at all after plum pudding. But why had he brought in eight, two enormous dishes with four on each? Good heavens! One of the Vikings had just started and was making short work of his mountain. And one after another they all walked into them until the whole eight had disappeared. I should have nothing to say about hunger, misery, and cold when I came home. My head was going round. The temperature must have been as many degrees above zero in here as it was below zero outside. I looked up at Visting's bunk, where a thermometer was hanging. Plus ninety-five degrees Fahrenheit. The Vikings did not seem to take the slightest notice of this trifle. Their work with the Napoleons continued undisturbed. Soon the gorgeous cake was a thing of the past, and cigars came out. Everyone, without exception, allowed himself this luxury. Up to now they had not shown much sign of abstinence. I wanted to know what was their attitude with regard to strong drinks. I had heard, of course, that indulgence in alcohol on polar expeditions was very harmful, not to say dangerous. Poor boys, I thought to myself, that must be the reason of your fondness for cake. A man must have one vice at least. Deprived of the pleasure of drinking, they make up for it in gluttony. Yes, now I could see it quite plainly, and I was heartily sorry for them. I wondered how the Napoleons felt now. They looked rather depressed. No doubt the cake took some time to settle down. Lindstrom, who seemed unquestionably the most wide awake of them all, came in and began to clear the table. I expected to see every man roll into his bunk to digest. But no, that side of the question did not appear to trouble them much. They remained seated as though expecting more. Oh, yes, of course, there was coffee to come. Lindstrom was already in the doorway with cups and jugs. A cup of coffee would be just the thing after such a meal. Stibberud! This was Lindstrom's voice, calling from some place in the far distance. Hurry up, before they get warm! I rushed after Stibberud to see what the things were that were not to get warm. I thought it might possibly be something that was to be taken outside. Great heaven! There was Lindstrom, lying on his stomach up in the loft, and handing down through the trap-door, what do you think? A bottle of Benedictine and a bottle of punch, both white with frost. Now I could see that the fish were to swim, what's more, they were to be drowned. A happier smile than that with which Stubber had received the bottles, or more careful and affectionate handling than they received on their way through the kitchen, I have never seen. I was touched. Ah, these boys knew how a liqueur should be served. Must be served cold, was on the label of the punch bottle. I can assure P. A. Larson that his prescription was followed to the letter that evening. Then the gramophone made its appearance, and it did me good to see the delight with which it was received. They seemed to like this best, after all, and every man had music to suit his taste. All agreed to honour the cook for all his pains, and the concert therefore began with Tarara Bumdie, followed by the Apache Waltz. His part of the programme was concluded with a humorous recitation. Meanwhile, he stood at the doorway with a beatific smile. This did him good. In this way, the music went the round, and all had their favourite tunes. Certain numbers were kept to the last. I could see that they were to the taste of all. First came an air from the Huguenots, sung by Mikhailova. This showed the Vikings to be musical. It was beautifully sung. "'But look here!' cried an impatient voice. "'Aren't we going to have Borkild Brin tonight?' Yes, was the answer, here she comes. And Solveig's song followed. It was a pity Borghild Brin was not there. I believe the most rapturous applause would not have moved her so much as the way her song was received here that evening. As the notes rang clear and pure through the room, one could see the faces grow serious. No doubt the words of the poem affected them all as they sat there in the dark winter night, on the vast wilderness of ice, thousands and thousands of miles from all that was dear to them. I think that was so, but it was the lovely melody given with perfect finish and rich natural powers that opened their hearts. One could see how it did them good, 
it was as though they were afraid of the sound of their own voices afterwards. At last one of them could keep silence no longer. "'My word, how beautifully she sings!' he exclaimed. "'Especially the ending. I was a little bit afraid that she would give the last note too sharp in spite of the masterly way in which she controls her voice. And it's outrageously high, too. But instead of that, the note came so pure and soft and full that it alone was enough to make a better man of one. And then this enthusiastic listener tells them how he once heard the same song, but with a very different result. It went quite well, he says, until it came to the final note. Then you could see the singer fill her mighty bosom for the effort, and out came a note so shrill that, well, you remember the walls of Jericho. After this the gramophone is put away. No one seems to want any more. Now it is already half-past eight. It must be nearly bedtime. The feast has lasted long enough with food, drink and music. Then they all get on their feet and there is a cry of bows and arrows. Now, I say to myself, as I withdraw into the corner where the clothes are hanging, now the alcohol is beginning to take effect. It is evident that something extraordinarily interesting is going to take place as they are all so active. One of them goes behind the door and fetches out a little cork target, and another brings out of his bunk a box of darts. So it is dart throwing. The children must be amused. The target is hung up on the door of the kitchen leading to the penthouse, and the man who is to throw first takes up his position at the end of the table at a distance of three yards. And now the shooting competition begins amid laughter and noise. There are marksmen of all kinds, good, bad and indifferent. Here comes the champion. One can see that by the determined way in which he raises the dart and sends it flying. His will no doubt be the top score. That is Stuberid. Of the five darts he throws, two are in the bull's-eye and three close to it. The next is Johansson. He is not bad either, but he does not equal the other's score. Then comes Bjarland. I wonder whether he is as smart at this game as he is on ski. He places himself at the end of the table, like the others, but takes a giant stride forward. He is a leery one, this. Now he is not more than a yard and a half from the target. He throws well. The darts describe a great round arch. This is what is known as throwing with a high trajectory, and it is received with great applause. The trajectory turns out to be too high, and all his darts land in the wall above the door. Hassel throws with calculation. What he calculates it is not easy to understand, not on hitting the target, apparently, but if his calculations have to do with the kitchen door, then they are more successful. Whether Amundsen calculates or not makes very little difference. His are all misses, in any case. Visting's form is the same. Prestrud is about halfway between the good shots and the bad. Hansen throws like a professional, slinging his dart with great force. He evidently thinks he is hunting walrus. All the scores are carefully entered in a book, and prizes will be given later on. Meanwhile, Lindstrom is playing patience. His day's work is now done but besides his cards he is much interested in what is going on round the target and puts in a good word here and there. Then he gets up with a determined look. He has one more duty to perform. This consists of changing the light from the big lamp under the ceiling to two small lamps, and the reason for the change is that the heat of the big lamp would be too strongly felt in the upper bunks. This operation is a gentle hint that the time has come for certain people to turn in. The room looks dark now that the great sun under the ceiling is extinguished. The two lamps that are now alight are good enough, but one seems, nevertheless, to have made a retrograde step towards the days of pinewood torches. By degrees, then, the Vikings began to retire to rest. My description of the day's life at Framheim would be incomplete if I did not include this scene in it. Lindstrom's chief pride, I had been told, was that he was always the first man in bed, he would willingly sacrifice a great deal to hold this record. As a rule, he had no difficulty in fulfilling his desire, as nobody tried to be before him, but this evening it was otherwise. Stuberud was far advanced with his undressing when Lindstrom came in, and seeing a chance at last of being first in bed, at once challenged the cook. Lindstrom, who did not quite grasp the situation, accepted the challenge, 
and then the race began, and was followed by the others with great excitement. Now Stubberud is ready, and is just going to jump into his bunk, which is over Lindstrom's, when he suddenly feels himself clutched by the leg and held back. Lindstrom hangs on to the leg with all his force, crying out in the most pitiable voice, "'Wait a bit, old man, till I'm undressed too!' It reminded me rather of the man who was going to fight, and called out, "'Wait till I get a hold of you!' But the other was not to be persuaded. He was determined to win. Then Lindstrom let go, tore off his braces, he had time for no more, and dived headfirst into his bunk. Stubberud tried to protest. This was not fair, he was not undressed, and so on. "'That doesn't matter,' replied the fat man. "'I was first all the same.' The scene was followed with great amusement and shouts of encouragement, and ended in a storm of applause when Lindstrom disappeared into his bunk with his clothes on. But that was not the end of the business, for his leap into the bunk was followed by a fearful crash, to which no one paid any attention in the excitement of the moment, himself least of all. But now the consequences appeared. The shelf along the side of his bunk, on which he kept a large assortment of things, had fallen down and filled the bunk with rifles, ammunition, gramophone discs, tool-boxes, sweetmeat boxes, pipes, tins of tobacco, ashtrays, box of matches, etc., and there was no room left for the man himself. He had to get out again, and his defeat was doubly hard. With shame he acknowledged Stubberud as the victor. But, he added, you shan't be first another time. One by one the others turned in. Books were produced, here and there a pipe as well and in this way the last hour was passed. At eleven o'clock precisely the lamps were put out, and the day was at an end. Soon after my host goes to the door, and I follow him out. I had told him I had to leave again this evening, and he is going to see me off. "'I'll take you as far as the depot,' he says. "'The rest of the way you can manage by yourself. The weather has improved considerably, but it is dark, horribly dark. "'So that we may find the way more easily,' he says, "'I'll take my trio.' If they don't see the way, they'll smell it out. Having let loose the three dogs, who evidently wonder what the meaning of it may be, he puts a lantern on a stack of timber, to show him the way back, I suppose, and we go off. The dogs are evidently accustomed to go this way, for they set off at once in the direction of the depot. Yes, says my companion, it's not to be wondered at that they know the way. They have gone it every day, once at least, often two or three times since we came here. There are three of us who always take our daily walk in this direction, Bjarland, Stubberud, and I. As you saw this morning, those two went out at half-past eight. They did that so as to be back to work at nine. We have so much to do that we can't afford to lose any time, so they take their walk to the depot and back. At nine I generally do the same. The others began the winter with the same good resolution. They were all so enthusiastic for a morning walk. But the enthusiasm didn't last long, and now we three are the only enthusiasts left. But, short as the way is, about six hundred and fifty yards, we should not venture to go without those marks that you saw, and without our dogs. I have often hung out a lantern, too, but when it is as cold as this evening, the paraffin freezes and the light goes out. Losing one's way here might be a very serious matter, and I don't want to run the risk of it. Here we have the first mark-post. We were lucky to come straight upon it. The dogs are on ahead, making for the depot. Another reason for being very careful on the way to the depot is that there is a big hole, twenty feet deep, just by a hummock on that slope, where you remember the last flag stands. If one missed one's way and fell into it, one might get hurt. We passed close to the second mark. The next two marks are more difficult to hit off. They're so low, and I often wait and call the dogs to me to find the way, as I'm going to do now, for instance. It's impossible to see anything unless you come right on it, so we must wait and let the dogs help us. I know exactly the number of paces between each mark, and when I have gone that number I stop and first examine the ground close by. If that is no good, I whistle for the dogs, who come at once. Now you'll see. A long whistle. It won't be long before they're here. I can hear them already. He was right. The dogs came running out of the darkness straight towards us. To let them see that we want to find the way to the depot, we must begin to walk on. We did so. As soon as the dogs saw this, they went forward again, but this time at a pace that allowed us to keep up with them at a trot, and soon after we were at the last mark. As you see, my lantern over at the camp is just going out, so I hope you'll excuse my accompanying you farther. 
"'You know your way, anyhow.' With these words we parted, and my host went back, followed by the faithful trio, whilst I... End of section 18 End of volume 1, chapter 8 A Day at Framheim The South Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon. The South Pole by Roald Amundsen. Translation by A. G. Carter. Section 19. Volume 1. Chapter 9. The End of the Winter. Part 1. After midwinter day, the time began to pass even more quickly than before. The darkest period was over, and the sun was daily drawing nearer. In the middle of the darkest time, Hassel came in one morning and announced that Elsa had eight puppies. Six of these were ladies, so their fate was sealed at once. They were killed and given to their elder relations, who appreciated them highly. It could hardly be seen that they chewed them at all. They went down practically whole. There could be no doubt of their approval, as the next day the other two had also disappeared. The weather conditions we encountered down here surprised us greatly. In every quarter of the Antarctic regions of which we had any information, the conditions had always proved very unsettled. On the Belgica, in the drift ice to the west of Graham Land, we always had rough, unpleasant weather. Nordenskjold's stay in the regions to the east of the same land gave the same report, storm after storm the whole time. And from the various English expeditions that have visited McMurdo Sound, we hear of continual violent winds. Indeed, we know now that while we were living on the barrier in the most splendid weather, calms or light breezes, Scott at his station, some four hundred miles to the west of us, was troubled by frequent storms, which greatly hindered his work. I had expected the temperature to remain high, as throughout the winter we could very clearly see the dark sky over the sea. Whenever the state of the air was favourable, the dark, heavy water sky was visible in a marked degree leaving no doubt that a large extent of Ross Sea was open the whole year round. Nevertheless, the temperature went very low, and without doubt the mean temperature shown by our observations for the year is the lowest that has ever been recorded. Our lowest temperature on August 13, 1911, was minus 74.2 degrees Fahrenheit. For five months of the year we were able to record temperatures below minus 58 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature rose with every wind, except the southwest. With that it more usually went down. We observed the aurora australis many times, but only a few of its appearances were specially powerful. They were of all possible forms, though the form of ribbon-like bands seemed to be commonest. Most of the aurorae were multicolored, red and green. My hypothesis of the solidity of the barrier, that is, of its resting upon underlying land, seems to be confirmed at all points by our observations during our twelve months' stay on it. In the course of the winter and spring, the pack ice is forced up against the barrier into pressure ridges of as much as forty feet in height. This took place only about a mile and a quarter from our hut, without our noticing its effect in the slightest degree. In my opinion, if this barrier had been afloat, the effect of the violent shock which took place at its edge would not merely have been noticeable, but would have shaken our house. While building the house, Stubberud and Bjarland heard a loud noise a long way off, but could feel nothing. During our whole stay we never heard a sound or felt a movement on this spot. Another very good proof seems to be afforded by the large theodolite that Preestrud used. It would take next to nothing to disturb its level. A slight change of temperature might be enough. So delicate an instrument would have soon shown an inclination if the barrier had been afloat. The day we entered the bay for the first time, a small piece of its western cape broke away. During the spring, the drift ice pressed in an insignificant part of one of the many points on the outer edge of the barrier. With these exceptions, we left the barrier as we found it, entirely unaltered. The soundings, which showed a rapid rise in the bottom as the Fram changed her position southward along the barrier, are also a clear sign that land is close at hand. Finally, the formations of the barrier appear to be the best proof. It could not rise to 1,100 feet, 
which we measured as the rise from Framheim to a point about thirty-one miles to the south, without subjacent land. Work now proceeded on the sledging outfit with feverish haste. We had for a long time been aware that we should have to do our utmost and make the best use of our time if we were to have the general outfit for our common use ready by the middle of August. For preparing our personal outfit we had to use our leisure time. By the first half of August we could begin to see the end of our labour. Bjarland had now finished the four sledges. It was a masterly piece of work that he had carried out in the course of the winter. They were extremely lightly constructed, but very strong. They were of the same length as the original sledges, about twelve feet, and were not shot. We should have a couple of the old Fram sledges with us, and these were shot with strong steel plates so that they could be used to the surface and going, rendered it necessary. The average weight of the new sledges was fifty-three pounds. We had thus saved as much as one hundred and ten pounds per sledge. When Bjarland had finished them, they were taken into the clothing store. The way in which Hansen and Wisting lashed the various parts together was a guarantee of their soundness. In fact, the only way in which one can expect work to be properly and carefully carried out is to have it done by the very men who are to use the things. They know what is at stake. They do it so that they may reach their destination. More than that, they do it so that they may come back again. Every piece of binding is first carefully examined and tested. Then it is put on, cautiously and accurately. Every turn is hauled taut, taking care that it is in its right place. And finally, the lashing is pointed in such a way that one would do best to use a knife or an axe if it has to be undone again. There is no danger of jerking it out with the fingers. A sledge journey of the kind we had before us is a serious undertaking, and the work has to be done seriously. It was no warm and comfortable workshop that they had for doing this. The clothing store was always the coldest place, probably because there was always a draught through it. There was a door out on to the barrier, and an open passage leading to the house. Fresh air was constantly passing through, though not in any very great quantity, but it does not take much to make itself felt when the air is at a temperature of about minus seventy-five degrees Fahrenheit, and when one is working with bare fingers. There were always some degrees of frost here. In order to keep the lashings pliable while they were being put on, they used a primus lamp on a stone close to where they were working. I often admired their patience when I stood watching them. I have seen them more than once working bare-handed by the hour, together, in a temperature of about minus twenty-two degrees Fahrenheit. This may pass for a short time, but through the coldest and darkest part of the winter, working day after day as they did, it is pretty severe, and a great trial of patience. Nor were their feet very well off, either. It makes hardly any difference what one puts on them if one has to stay still. Here, as elsewhere in the cold, it was found that boots with wooden soles were the best for sedentary work. But for some reason or other, the occupants of the clothing stool would not give their adherence to the wooden sole principle, and continued to work all through the winter in their reindeer skin and sealskin boots. They preferred stamping their feet to acknowledging the incontestable superiority of wooden soles in such conditions. As the sledges were finished, they were numbered from one to seven, and stored in the clothing department. The three old sledges we should have to use were made of the Frump's second expedition. They were extremely strong, and, of course, heavier than the new ones. They were all carefully overhauled. All the bindings and lashings were examined and replaced wherever necessary. The steel shoes were taken off one, but retained on the other two, in case we should meet with conditions where they would be required. In addition to this work of lashing, these two had plenty of other occupation. Whenever Wisting was not taken up by the work on the sledges, one could hear the hum of his sewing machine. He had a thousand different things to do in his sewing room, and was in there nearly every day till late in the evening. It was only when the target and darts came out at half-past eight that he showed himself, and if it had not been that he had undertaken the position of marker at these competitions, we should hardly have seen him even then. His first important piece of work was making four three-man tents into two. It was not easy to manage these rather large tents in the little hole that went by the name of the sewing-room. Of course, he used a table in the clothing-room for cutting out, but, all the same, it is a mystery how he contrived to get hold of the right seams when he sat in his hole. I was prepared to see the most curious-looking tents when once they were brought out and set up in daylight. One might imagine that the floor of one would be sewed on to the side of another. But nothing of the sort happened. When the tents were brought out for the first time and set up, they proved to be perfect. One would have thought they had been made in a big sail-loft instead of in a snow-drift. Neat-fingered fellows like this are priceless on such an expedition as ours. 
on the second from expedition they used double tents and as of course nothing is so good and serviceable as the thing one has not got the praises of double tents were now sung in every key well i naturally had to admit that a house with double walls is warmer than one with single walls but at the same time one must not lose sight of the fact that the double-walled house is also twice as heavy and when one has to consider the weight of a pocket handkerchief it will be understood that the question of the real advantages of the double-walled house had to be thoroughly considered before taking the step of committing oneself to it i had thought that with double walls one would possibly avoid some of the rhyme that is generally so troublesome in the tents and often becomes a serious matter if then the double walls would in any way prevent or improve this condition of things i could see the advantage of having them for the increased weight caused by the daily deposit of rhyme would in a short time be equal to if not greater than the additional weight of the double tent these double tents are made so that the outer tent is fast and the inner loose in the course of our discussion it appeared that the deposit of rhyme occurred just as quickly on a double tent as on a single one and thus the utility of the double tent appeared to me to be rather doubtful if the object was merely to have it a few degrees warmer in the tent i thought it best to sacrifice this comfort to the weight we should thereby save moreover we were so plentifully supplied with warm sleeping things that we should not have to suffer any hardship but another question cropped up as a result of this discussion the question of what was the most useful colour for a tent we were soon agreed that a dark-coloured tent was best for several reasons in the first place as a relief to the eyes we knew well enough what a comfort it would be to come into a dark tent after travelling all day on the glistening barrier surface in the next place the dark colour would make the tent a good deal warmer when the sun was up another important consideration one may easily prove this by walking in dark clothes in a hot sun and afterwards changing to white ones and finally a dark tent would be far easier to see on the white surface than a light one when all these questions had been discussed and the superiority of a dark tent admitted we were doubly keen on it since all our tents happened to be light not to say white and the possibility of getting dark ones was not very apparent it is true we had a few yards of darkish gabardine or light windproof material which would have been extremely suitable for this purpose but every yard of it had long ago been destined for some other use so that did not get us out of the difficulty but said somebody and he had a very cunning air as he uttered that but but haven't we got ink and ink powder that we can dye our tents dark with yes of course we all smiled indulgently the thing was so plain that it was almost silly to mention it but all the same the man was forgiven his silliness and dye works were established Wisting accepted the position of dyer, in addition to his other duties, and succeeded so well that before very long we had two dark blue tents instead of the white ones. These looked very well, no doubt, freshly dyed as they were, but the question was, what would they look like after a couple of months' use? The general opinion was that they would probably, to a great extent, have reverted to their original colour, or lack of colour. Some better patent had to be invented. As we were sitting over our coffee after dinner one day, someone suddenly suggested but look here suppose we took our bunk curtains and made an outer tent of them this time the smile that passed over the company as they put down their cups was almost compassionate nothing was said but the silence meant something like poor chap as if we hadn't all thought of that long ago the proposal was adopted without discussion and wisting had another long job in addition to all the rest our bunk curtains were dark red and made of very light material they were sewed together, curtain to curtain, and finally the whole was made into an outer tent. The curtains only sufficed for one tent, but, remembering that half a loaf is better than no bread, we had to be satisfied with this. The red tent, which was set up a few days after, met with unqualified approval. It would be visible some miles away in the snow. Another important advantage was that it would protect and preserve the main tent. Inside, the effect of the combination of red and blue was to give an agreeably dark shade. Another question was how to protect the tent from a hundred loose dogs, who were no better behaved than others of their kind. If the tent became stiff and brittle, it might be spoiled in a very short time. And the demands we made on our tents were considerable. We expected them to last at least one hundred and twenty days. I therefore got Wisting to make two tent protectors, or guards. These guards consisted simply of a piece of gabardine long enough to stretch all round the tent and to act as a fence in preventing the dogs from coming in direct contact with the tents. The guards were made with loops, so that they could be stretched upon ski-poles. They looked very fine when they were finished, but they never came to be used. 
for, as soon as we began the journey, we found a material that was even more suitable and always to be had. Snow. Idiots. Of course, we all knew that, only we wouldn't say so. Well, that was one against us. However, the guards came in well as reserve material on the trip, and many were the uses they were put to. In the next place, Wisting had to make wind clothing for every man. That we had brought out proved to be too small, but the things he made were big enough. There was easily room for two more in my trousers, but they have to be so. In these regions, one soon finds out that everything that is roomy is warm and comfortable, while everything that is tight, footgear of course excepted, is warm and uncomfortable. One quickly gets into a perspiration and spoils the clothes. Besides the breeches and light windcloth, he made stockings of the same material. I assumed that these stockings, worn among the other stockings we had on, would have an insulating effect. Opinions were greatly divided on this point, but I must confess, in common with my four companions on the polar journey, that I would never make a serious trip without them. They fulfilled all our expectations. The rime was deposited on them freely and was easily brushed off. If they got wet, it was easy to dry them in almost all weathers. I know of no material that dries so quickly as this windproof stuff. Another thing was that they protected the other stockings against tears, and made them last much longer than would otherwise have been the case. As evidence of how pleased we who took part in the long sledge journey were with these stockings, I may mention that when we reached the depot in 80 degrees south, on the homeward trip be it noted, that is, when we looked upon the journey as over, we found there some bags with various articles of clothing. In one of these were two pairs of windproof stockings. The bag presumably belonged to an opponent of the idea, and it may be imagined that there was some fun. We all wanted them, all without exception. The two lucky ones each seized his pair and hid it, as if it was the most costly treasure. What they wanted with them I cannot guess, as we were at home, but this example shows how we had learned to appreciate them. I recommend them most warmly to men who are undertaking similar expeditions, but, I must add, they must give themselves the trouble of taking off their footgear every evening, and brushing the rime off their stockings. If one does not do this, of course, the rime will thaw in the course of the night, and everything will be soaking wet in the morning. In that case, you must not blame the stockings, but yourself. After this, it was the turn of the underclothing. There was nothing in the tailoring and outfitting department that Wisting could not manage. Among our medical stores, we had two large rolls of the most beautiful fine light flannel, and of this he made underclothing for all of us. What we had brought out from home was made of extremely thick woolen material, and we were afraid that this would be too warm. Personally, I wore Wisting's make the whole trip, and have never known anything so perfect. Then he had covers for the sleeping bags to sew and patch, and one thing and another. Some people give one the impression of being able to make anything, and to get it done in no time. Others not. Hansen had his days well occupied, industrious and handy as he was. He was an expert at anything relating to sledges, and knew exactly what had to be done. Whatever he had a hand in, I could feel sure of. He never left anything to chance. Besides lashing the sledges, he had a number of other things to do. Amongst them, he was to prepare all the whips we required, two for each driver, or fourteen altogether. Stubbert was to supply the handles. In consultation with the carpenter's union, I had chosen a handle made of three narrow strips of hickory. I assumed that if these were securely lashed together, and the lashings covered with leather, they would make as strong a handle as one could expect to get. The idea of the composite handle of three pieces of wood was that it would give and bend, instead of breaking. We knew by experience that a solid whip handle did not last very long. It was arranged, then, that the handles were to be made by Stubberud, and passed on to Hansen. The whip lashes were made by Hassel, in the course of the winter, on the Eskimo model. They were round and heavy, as they should be, and dangerous to come near when they were wielded by an experienced hand. Hansen received these different parts to join them together and make the whip. As usual, this was done with all possible care. Three strong lashings were put on each handle, and these again were covered with leather. Personally, Hansen was not in favour of the triple hickory handle, but he did the work without raising any objection. We all remarked, it is true, that at this time, contrary to his habit, he spent the hours after supper with Wisting. I wondered a little at this, as I knew Hansen was very fond of a game of whist after supper, and never missed it unless he had work to do. I happened one evening to express my surprise at this, and Stubberud answered at once, "'He's making handles.' "'What sort of handles?' "'Whip handles, but,' Stubberud added, "'I'll guarantee those hickory handles I'm making. You can't have anything tougher and stronger than those.' 
He was rather sore about it, that was easy to see. The idea was his own, too. Then, talk of the devil, in walked Hansen, with a fine big whip in his hand. I, of course, appeared extremely surprised. What? I said. More whips? Yes, said he. I don't believe in those I'm making in the daytime, but here's a whip that I can trust. I must admit that it looked well. The whole handle was covered so that one could not see what it was made of. But, I ventured to object, are you sure it is as strong as the others? Oh, as to that, he answered, I am quite ready to back it against any of those. He did not say the word, nor was there any need. His meaning was unmistakable, and rotten whips sounded in our ears as plainly as if he had shouted it. I had no time to observe the effect of this terrible utterance, for a determined voice called out, "'We'll see about that!' I turned round, and there was Stubberud, leaning against the end of the table, evidently hurt by Hansen's words, which he took as a personal affront. "'If you dare risk your whip, come on!' He had taken down one of the insulted triple-handled whips from the shelf in his bunk, and stood in a fighting attitude. This promised well. We all looked at Hansen. He had gone too far to be able to draw back. He had to fight. He took his weapon in his hand and entered the ring. The conditions were arranged and accepted by both parties. They were to fight until one of the handles was broken. And then the whip duel began. The opponents were very serious over it. One, two, three. The first blow fell, handle against handle. The combatants had shut their eyes and awaited the result. When they opened them again, they shone with happy surprise. Both handles were as whole as before. Now each of them was really delighted with his own handle, and the blows fell faster. Stubberud, who was standing with his back to the table, got so excited over the unexpected result that, every time he raised his weapon, he gave the edge of the table a resounding smack without knowing it. How many rounds had been fought I do not know, when I heard a crack, followed by the words, "'There you can see, old man!' As Stubberud left the ring, I was able to see Hansen. He stood on the battlefield, eyeing his whip. It looked like a broken lily. The spectators had not been silent. They had followed the fight with excitement, amid laughters and shouts. "'That's right, Stubert. Don't give in. Bravo, Hansen. That's a good one.' The whips afterwards turned out remarkably well. Not that they lasted out the trip, but they held together for a long while. Whip handles are a very perishable commodity. If one used nothing but the lash, they would be everlasting. But, as a rule, one is not long satisfied with that. It is when one gives a confirmation, as we call it, that the handle breaks. A confirmation is generally held when some sinner or other has gone wrong and refuses to obey. It consists in taking the first opportunity, when the sledge stops, of going in among the dogs, taking out the defiant one, and laying into him with the handle. These confirmations, if they occur frequently, may use up a lot of handles. It was also arranged that Hansen should prepare goggles in the Eskimo fashion, and he began this work, but it soon appeared that every one had some patent of his own which was much better. Therefore it was given up, and every man made his own goggles. Stuberud's chief work was making the sledge cases lighter, and he succeeded in doing this, but not without hard work. It took far longer than one would have thought. The wood had a good many knots, and he often had to work against the grain. The planing was therefore rather difficult and slow. He planed a good deal off them, but could guarantee them, as he said. Their sides were not many millimetres thick. To strengthen them in the joints, corners of aluminium were put on. In addition to remaking the sledges, Bjarland had to get the ski ready. To fit the big broad boots we should wear, the Huitfeld fittings had to be much broader than usual, and we had such with us so that Bjarland had only to change them. The ski bindings were like the snow goggles, everyone had his own patent. I found the bindings that Bjarland had put on for himself so efficient that I had no hesitation in ordering similar ones for myself, and it may be said to their honour, and to the honour of him who made them, that they were first-rate, and served me well during the whole trip. They were, after all, only a retention of the old system, but, with the help of hooks and eyes, they could be put on and taken off in an instant, and those were the conditions we demanded of our bindings, that they should hold the foot as firmly as a vice, and should be easy to hook on and take off for we always had to take them off on the journey. If one left one's bindings out for a night, they were gone in the morning. The dogs looked upon them as a delicacy. The toe-strap also had to be removed in the evening. In other words, the ski had to be left absolutely bare. Johansen, besides his packing, was occupied in making weights and tent-pegs. The weights were very ingeniously made. The steel-yard system was adopted. 
If they were never used, it was not the fault of the weights. They were good enough. But the reason was that we had all our provisions so arranged that they could be taken without being weighed. We were all weighed on August 6, and it then appeared that Lindstrom was the heaviest, with thirteen stones eight pounds. On that occasion he was officially christened Fatty. The ten pegs Johansen made were the opposite of what such pegs usually are. In other words, they were flat instead of being high. We saw the advantage at once. Besides being so much lighter, they were many times stronger. I do not know that we ever broke a peg on the trip. Possibly we lost one or two. Most of them were brought home undamaged. Hassel worked at his whiplashes down in the petroleum store. It was an uncomfortable place for him, always cold, but he had the lashes ready by the time he had promised them. Preestrud made charts and copied out tables. Six of us were to have these copies. In each sledge there was a combined provision and observation book, bearing the same number as the sledge. It contained, first, an exact list of the provisions contained in each case on that sledge, and, in addition, the necessary tables for our astronomical observations. In these books each man kept a daily account of every scrap of provisions he took out. In this way we could always check the contents of the cases and know what quantity of provisions we had. Farther on in the book the observations were entered, and the distance covered for the day, course, and so on. That is a rough outline of what we were doing in the course of the winter in working hours. Besides this, there were, of course, a hundred things that every man had to do for his personal equipment. During the winter, each man had his outfit served out to him, so that he might have time to make whatever alterations he found necessary. Every man received a heavy and a lighter suit of reindeer skin, as well as reindeer skin mitts and stockings. He also had dog skin stockings and seal skin kamiks. In addition, there was a complete outfit of underclothing and wind clothes. All were served alike, there was no priority at all. The skin clothing was the first to be tackled, and here there was a good deal to be done, as nothing had been made to measure. One man found that the hood of his anorak came too far down over his eyes, another that it did not come down far enough, so both had to set to work at alterations, one cutting off, the other adding a piece. One found his trousers too long, another too short, and they had to alter those. However, they managed it. The needle was always at work, either for sewing a piece on or for hemming the shortened piece. Although we began this work in good time, it looked as if we should never have finished. The room orderly had to sweep out huge piles of strips and reindeer hair every morning, but the next morning there were just as many. If we had stayed there, I am sure we should still be sitting and sewing away at our outfit. A number of patterns were invented. Of course, the everlasting mask for the face was to the fore, and took the form of nose protectors. I, too, allowed myself to be beguiled into experimenting, with good reason, as I thought, but with extremely poor results. I had hit upon something which, of course, I thought much better than anything that had been previously tried. The day I put on my invention, I not only got my nose frozen, but my forehead and cheek as well. I never tried it again. Hassel was great at new inventions. He wore nose protectors all over him. These patterns are very good things for passing the time. When one actually takes the field, they all vanish. They are useless for serious work. The sleeping bags were also a great source of interest. Johansen was at work on the double one he was so keen on. Heaven knows how many skins he put into it. I don't, nor did I ever try to find out. Bjarland was also in full swing with alterations to his. He found the opening at the top inconvenient, and preferred to have it in the middle. His arrangement of a flap, with buttons and loops, made it easy to mistake him for a colonel of dragoons when he was in bed. He was tremendously pleased with it, but so he was with his snow goggles, in spite of the fact that he could not see with them, and that they allowed him to become snow-blind. The rest of us kept our sleeping bags as they were, only lengthening or shortening them as required. We were all greatly pleased with the device for closing them, on the plan of a sack. Outside our bags we had a cover of very thin canvas. This was extremely useful, and I would not be without it for anything. In the daytime the sleeping bag was always well protected by this cover. No snow could get in. At night it was perhaps even more useful, as it protected the bag from the moisture of the breath. Instead of condensing on the skin and making it wet, this settled on the cover, forming in the course of the night a film of ice, which disappeared again during the day, breaking off while the bag lay stretched on the sledge. This cover ought to be of ample size. It is important that it should be rather longer than the sleeping bag, so that one may have plenty of it round the neck, and thus prevent the breath from penetrating into the bag. We all had double bags, 
an inner and an outer one. The inner one was of calf skin or thin female reindeer skin, and quite light. The outer one was of heavy buck reindeer skin, and weighed about thirteen pounds. Both were open at the end, like a sack, and were laced together round the neck. I have always found this pattern the easiest, simplest, most comfortable, and best. We recommend it to all. Novelties in the way of snow goggles were many. This was, of course, a matter of the greatest importance, and required study. It was studied, too. The particular problem was to find good goggles without glass. It is true that I had worn nothing but a pair of ordinary spectacles with light yellow glasses all the autumn, and that they had proved excellent. But for the long journey I was afraid these would give insufficient protection. I therefore threw myself into the competition for the best patent. The end of it was that we all went in for leather goggles, with a little slit for the eyes. The Bialand patent won the prize and was most adopted. Hassel had his own invention, combined with a nose protector. When spread out, it reminded me of the American eagle. I never saw him use it. Nor did any of us use these new goggles except Bialand. He used his own goggles the whole way, but then he was the only one who became snow-blind. The spectacles I wore, Hansen had the same, they were the only two pairs we had, gave perfect protection. Not once did I have a sign of snow-blindness. They were exactly like other spectacles, without any gauze at all round the glasses. The light could penetrate everywhere. Dr. Schanz, of Dresden, who sent me these glasses, has every right to be satisfied with his invention. It beats anything I have ever tried or seen. The next great question was our boots. I had expressly pointed out that boots must be taken, whether the person concerned intended to wear them or not, for boots were indispensable in case of having to cross any glacier, which was a contingency we had to reckon with from the descriptions we had read of the country. With this proviso, every one might do as he pleased, and all began by improving their boots in accordance with our previous experience. The improvement consisted in making them larger. Wisting took mine in hand again, and began once more to pull them to pieces. It is only by tearing a thing to pieces that one can see what the work is like. We gained a good insight into the way our boots had been made. Stronger or more conscientious work it would be impossible to find. It was hard work pulling them to pieces. This time mine lost a couple more souls. How many that made altogether I do not remember, but now I got what I always called for, room enough. Besides being able to wear all the foot coverings I had, I could also find room for a wooden sole. That made me happy. My great object was achieved. Now the temperature could be as low as it liked. It would not get through the wooden soles and my various stockings, seven pairs I think in all. I was pleased that evening, as the struggle had been a long one. It had taken me nearly two years to arrive at this result. And then there was the dog harness, which we must all have in order. The experience of the last depot journey, when two dogs fell into a crevasse through faulty harness, must not be allowed to repeat itself. We therefore devoted great care and attention to this gear, and used all the best materials we had. The result rewarded our pains. We had good, strong harness for every team. This description will, perhaps, open the eyes of some people, and show them that the equipment of an expedition such as we were about to enter upon is not the affair of a day. It is not money alone that makes for the success of such an expedition, though heaven knows it is a good thing to have, but it is in a great measure, indeed I may say that this is the greatest factor, the way in which the expedition is equipped, the way in which every difficulty is foreseen and precautions taken for meeting or avoiding it. Victory awaits him who has everything in order. Luck, people call it. Defeat is certain for him who has neglected to take the necessary precautions in time. This is called bad luck. But pray do not think this is an epitaph I wish to have inscribed on my own tomb. No, honour where honour is due, honour to my faithful comrades who, by their patience, perseverance and experience, brought our equipment to the limit of perfection, and thereby rendered our victory possible. End of section 19《》20 of the South Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna Simon.《》The South Pole by Roald Amundsen. Translation by A. G. Carter.《》20, Volume 1, Chapter 9, The End of the Winter, Part 2. 
On August 16 we began to pack our sledges. Two were placed in the Crystal Palace and two in the clothing store. It was a great advantage to be able to do this work under cover. At this time the temperature was dancing a can-can between minus 58 degrees and minus 75 degrees Fahrenheit, with an occasional refreshing breeze of 13 or 14 miles an hour. It would have been almost an impossibility to pack the sledges out of doors under these conditions if it was to be done carefully and firmly, and of course it had to be so done. Our fixed wire-rope lashings had to be laced together with lengths of thin rope, and this took time, but when properly done, as it was now, the cases were held as though in a vice, and could not move. The zinc plates we had had under the sledges to keep them up in loose snow had been taken off. We could not see that we should have any use for them. In their place we had lashed a spare ski under each sledge, and these were very useful later. By August 22nd all the sledges were ready, waiting to be driven away. The dogs did not like the cold weather we had now had for so long. When the temperature went down between minus 58 degrees and minus 75 degrees Fahrenheit, one could see by their movements that they felt it. They stood still and raised their feet from the ground in turn, holding each foot up for a while before putting it down again on the cold surface. They were cunning and resourceful in the extreme. They did not care very much for fish, and some of them were difficult to get into the tents on the evenings when they knew there was fish. Stubot, especially, had a great deal of trouble with one of the young dogs. Funcha was his name. He was born at Madeira during our stay there in September 1910. On meat evenings each man, after fastening up his dogs, went, as has been described, up to the wall of the meat tent and took his box of chopped up meat, which was put out there. Funcho used to watch for this moment. When he saw Stubert take the box, he knew there was meat, and then he came quietly into the tent, as though there was nothing the matter. If, on the other hand, Stubert showed no signs of fetching the box, the dog would not come, nor was it possible to get hold of him. This happened a few times but then Stubert hit upon a stratagem. When Funcho, as usual, even on a fish evening, watched the scene of chaining up the other dogs from a distance, Stubert went calmly up to the wall, took the empty box that lay there, put it on his shoulder, and returned to the tent. Funcho was taken in. He hurried joyfully into the tent, delighted, no doubt, with Stubert's generosity in providing meat two evenings running. But there, to his great surprise, a very different reception awaited him from that he expected. He was seized by the neck and made fast for the night. After an ugly scowl at the empty box, he looked at Stubert. What he thought, I am not sure. Certain it is that the ruse was not often successful after that. Funcho got a dried fish for supper, and had to be content with it. We did not lose many dogs in the course of the winter. Two, Jeppe and Jacob, died of some disease or other. Knachten was shot, as he lost almost all his hair over half his body. Madero, born at Madeira, disappeared early in the autumn. Tom disappeared later. Both these undoubtedly fell into crevasses. We had a very good opportunity, twice, of seeing how this might happen. Both times we saw the dog disappear into the crevasse, and could watch him from the surface. He went quite quietly, backwards and forwards down below, without uttering a sound. These crevasses were not deep, but they were steep-sided, so that the dog could not get out without help. The two dogs I have mentioned undoubtedly met their death in this way, a slow death it must be, when one remembers how tenacious of life a dog is. It happened several times that dogs disappeared, were absent for some days, and then came back. Possibly they had been down a crevasse, and had finally succeeded in getting out of it again. Curiously enough, they did not pay much attention to the weather when they went on trips of this kind. When the humour took them, they would disappear, even if the temperature was down in the fifties below zero, with wind and driving snow. Thus Ja'ala, a lady belonging to Bialand, took it into her head to go off with three attendant cavaliers. We came upon them later. They were then lying quietly behind a hummock down on the ice, and seemed to be quite happy. They had been away for about eight days without food, and during that time the temperature had seldom been above minus fifty-eight degrees Fahrenheit. August 23rd arrived, calm, partly overcast, and minus 43.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Finer weather for taking out our sledges and driving them over to the starting point could not be imagined. They had to be brought up through the door of the clothing store. It was the largest and the easiest to get through. We had first to dig away the snow which Leslie had been allowed to collect there, as the inmates of this department had for some time past used the inner passage. The snow had blotted out everything, so that no sign of the entrance could be seen, 
but with a couple of strong shovels and a couple of strong men to use them, the opening was soon laid bare. To get the sledges up was a longer business. They weighed 880 pounds apiece, and the way up to the surface was steep. A tackle was rigged, and by hauling and shoving they slowly, one by one, came up into daylight. We dragged them away to a place near the instrument screen so as to get a clear start away from the house. The dogs were fresh and wild, and wanted plenty of room. A case, not to mention a post, still less the instrument screen, would all have been objects of extreme interest, to which, if there had been the slightest opportunity, their course would infallibly have been directed. The protests of their drivers would have been of little avail. The dogs had not been let loose that morning, and every man was now in his tent harnessing them. Meanwhile I stood contemplating the packed sledges that stood there ready to begin the long journey. I tried to work up a little poetry. The ever-restless spirit of man. The mysterious, awe-inspiring wilderness of ice. But it was no good. I suppose it was too early in the morning. I abandoned my efforts, after coming to the conclusion that each sledge gave one more the idea of a coffin than of anything else, all the cases being painted black. It was as we had expected. The dogs were on the verge of exploding. What a time we had getting them all into the traces! They could not stand still an instant. Either it was a friend they wanted to wish good morning, or it was an enemy they were longing to fly at. There was always something going on, when they kicked out with their hind legs, raising a cloud of snow, or glared defiantly at each other, it often caused their driver an anxious moment. If he had his eye on them at this stage, he might, by intervening quickly and firmly, prevent the impending battle. But one cannot be everywhere at once, and the result was a series of the wildest fights. Strange beasts! They had been going about the place comparatively peacefully the whole winter, and now, as soon as they were in harness, they must needs fight as if their lives depended on it. At last we were all ready and away. It was the first time we had driven with teams of twelve, so that we were anxious to see the result. It went better than we had expected. Of course, not like an express train, but we could not expect that the first time. Some of the dogs had grown too fat in the course of the winter, and had difficulty in keeping up. For them this first trip was a stiff pull. But most of them were in excellent condition. Fine, rounded bodies, not lumpish. It did not take long to get up the hill this time. Most of them had to stop and get their wind on the slope, but there were some that did it without a halt. Up by the top everything looked just as we had left it in April. The flag was still standing where we had planted it, and did not look much the worse for wear. And, what was still stranger, we could see our old tracks southward. We drove all our sledges well up, unharnessed the dogs, and let them go. We took it for granted that they would all rush joyfully home to the flesh-pots, nor did the greater number disappoint us. They set off gaily homewards, and soon the ice was strewn with dogs. They did not behave altogether like good children. In some places there was a sort of mist over the ice. This was the cloud of snow thrown up by the combatants. But on their return they were irreproachable. One could not take any notice of a halt here and there. At the inspection that evening, it appeared that ten of them were missing. That was strange. Could all ten have gone down crevasses? It seemed unlikely. Next morning, two men went over to the starting point to look for the missing dogs. On the way they crossed a couple of crevasses, but there was no dog to be seen. When they arrived at the place where the sledges stood, there lay all ten curled up asleep. They were lying by their own sledges, and did not seem to take the slightest notice of the men's arrival. One or two of them may have opened an eye, but that was all. When they were roused and given to understand by unmistakable signs that their presence was desired at home, they seemed astonished beyond all bounds. Some of them simply declined to believe it. They merely turned round a few times and lay down again on the same spot. They had to be flogged home. Can anything more inexplicable be imagined? There they lay three miles from their comfortable home, where they knew that abundance of food awaited them, in a temperature of minus forty degrees Fahrenheit. Although they had now been out for twenty-four hours, none of them gave a sign of wanting to leave the spot. If it had been summer with warm sunshine, one might have understood it, but as it was, no. That day, August 24th, the sun appeared above the barrier again, for the first time in four months. He looked very smiling, with a friendly nod for the old pressure ridges he had seen for so many years, but when his first beams reached the starting point his face might well show surprise. "'Well, if they're not first after all, and I've been doing all I could to get there!' 
It could not be denied. We had won the race, and reached the barrier a day before him. The day for our actual start could not be fixed. We should have to wait until the temperature moderated somewhat. So long as it continued to grovel in the depths, we could not think of setting out. All our things were now ready up on the barrier, and nothing remained but to harness the dogs and start. When I say all our things were ready, this is not the impression anyone would have gained who looked in on us. The cutting out and sewing were going on worse than ever. What had previously occurred to one as a thing of secondary importance, which might be done if there was time, but might otherwise quite well be dropped, now suddenly appeared as the most important part of the whole outfit. And then out came the knife and cut away, until great heaps of offcuts and hair lay about the floor. Then the needle was produced, and seam after seam added to those there were already. The days went by, and the temperature would give no sign of spring. Now and then it would make a jump of about thirty degrees, but only to sink just as rapidly back to minus fifty-eight degrees Fahrenheit. It is not at all pleasant to hang about waiting like this. I always have the idea that I am the only one who is left behind, while all the others are out on the road. And I could guess that I was not the only one of us who felt this. I'd give something to know how far Scott is today. Oh, he's not out yet, bless you. It's much too cold for his ponies. Ah, but how do you know they have it as cold as this? I expect it's far warmer where they are, among the mountains, and you can take your oath they're not lying idle. Those boys have shown what they can do. This was the sort of conversation one could hear daily. The uncertainty was worrying many of us, not all, and personally I felt it a great deal. I was determined to get away as soon as it was at all possible, and the objection that much might be lost by starting too early did not seem to me to have much force. If we saw that it was too cold, all we had to do was to turn back, so that I could not see there was any risk. September came, with minus 43.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That is a temperature that one can always stand, but we had better wait and see what it is going to do. Perhaps it will only play its old tricks again. Next day, minus 63.4 degrees Fahrenheit, calm and clear. September 6th, minus 20.2 degrees Fahrenheit. At last, the change had come, and we thought it was high time. Next day, minus 7.6 degrees Fahrenheit. The little slant of wind that came from the east felt quite like a mild spring breeze. Well, at any rate, we now had a good temperature to start in. Every man ready. Tomorrow we are off. September 8 arrived. We turned out as usual, had breakfast, and were then on the move. We had not much to do. The empty sledges we were to use for driving up to the starting point were ready. We only had to throw a few things onto them. But it turned out that the mere fact of having so few things was the cause of its taking a long time. We were to harness twelve dogs to the empty sledges, and we had an idea that it would cost us a struggle to get away. We helped each other, two and two, to bring the dogs to the sledges and harness them. Those who were really careful had anchored their sledges to a peg firmly fixed in the snow. Others had contented themselves with capsizing their sledges, and others again were even more reckless. We all had to be ready before the first man could start, otherwise it would have been impossible for those who were behind to hold in their dogs, and the result would have been a false start. Our dogs were in a fearful state of excitement and confusion that morning, but at last everything was ready, barring one or two trifles. Then I suddenly heard a wild yell, and, spinning round, I saw a team tearing off without a driver. The next driver rushed forward to help, with the result that his dogs made off after the others. The two sledges were on ahead, and the two drivers after them in full gallop, but the odds were too unequal. In a few moments the drivers were beaten. The two runaway teams had made off in a southwesterly direction, and were going like the wind. The men had hard work. They had long ago stopped running, and were now following in the tracks of the sledges. The dogs had disappeared behind the ridges, which the men did not reach till much later. Meanwhile, the rest of us waited. The question was, what would those two do when at last they had come up with their sledges? Would they turn and go home, or would they drive up to the starting point? Waiting was no fun under any circumstances, and so we decided to go on to the starting point, and, if necessary, wait there. No sooner said than done, and away we went. Now we should see what command the fellows had over their dogs, for, in all canine probability, these teams would now try to follow the same course that the runaways had taken. This fear turned out not to be groundless. 
Three managed to turn their dogs and put them in the right direction, but the other two were off on a new course. Afterwards, of course, they tried to make out that they thought we were all going that way. I smiled, but said nothing. It had happened more than once that my own dogs had taken charge. No doubt I had felt rather foolish at the time, but after all... It was not till noon that we all assembled with our sledges. The drivers of the runaways had had stiff work to catch them, and were wet through with their exertions. I had some thoughts of turning back, as three young puppies had followed us. If we went on, we should have to shoot them. But to turn back after all this work, and then probably have the same thing over again next morning, was not a pleasant prospect. And, above all, to see Lindstrom standing at the door, shaking with laughter. No, we had better go on. I think we were all agreed in this. The dogs were now harnessed to the loaded sledges, and the empty ones were stacked one above another. At one thirty p.m. we were off. The old tracks were soon lost sight of, but we immediately picked up the line of flags that had been set up at every second kilometre on the last depot journey. The going was splendid, and we went at a rattling pace to the south. We did not go very far the first day, eleven and three-quarter miles, and pitched our camp at 3.30 p.m. The first night out is never very pleasant, but this time it was awful. There was such a row going on among our ninety dogs that we could not close our eyes. It was a blessed relief when four in the morning came around and we could begin to get up. We had to shoot the three puppies when we stopped for lunch that day. The going was the same. Nothing could be better. The flags we were following stood just as we had left them. They showed no trace of there having been any snowfall in the interval. That day we did fifteen and a half miles. The dogs were not yet in training, but were picking up every hour. By the tenth they seemed to have reached their full vigour. That day none of us could hold in his team. They all wanted to get forward, with the result that one team ran into another, and confusion followed. This was a tiresome business. The dogs wore themselves out to no purpose, and, of course, the time spent in extricating them from one another was lost. They were perfectly wild that day. When Lassessen, for instance, caught sight of his enemy Hans, who was in another team, he immediately encouraged his friend Fix to help him. These two then put on all the speed they could, with the result that the others in the same team were excited by the sudden acceleration and joined in the spurt. It made no difference how the driver tried to stop them. They went on just as furiously, until they reached the team that included the object of Lassessen's and Fix's endeavours. Then the two teams dashed into each other and we had ninety-six dogs' legs to sort out. The only thing that could be done was to let those who could not hold in their teams unharness some of the dogs and tie them on the sledge. In this way we got things to work satisfactorily at last. We covered eighteen and a half miles that day. On Monday, the 11th, we woke up to a temperature of minus sixty-seven point nine degrees Fahrenheit. The weather was splendid, calm, and clear. We could see by the dogs that they were not feeling happy, as they had kept comparatively quiet that night. The cold affected the going at once. It was slow and unyielding. We came across some crevasses, and Hans's sledge was nearly in one, but it was held up, and he came out of it without serious consequences. The cold caused no discomfort on the march. On the contrary, at times it was too warm. One's breath was like a cloud, and so thick was the vapour over the dogs that one could not see one team from the next though the sledges were being driven close to one another. On the 12th it was minus 61.6 degrees Fahrenheit, with a breeze dead against us. This was undeniably bitter. It was easy to see that the temperature was too much for the dogs. In the morning especially they were a pitiful sight. They lay rolled up as tightly as possible, with their noses under their tails, and from time to time one could see a shiver run through their bodies. Indeed, some of them were constantly shivering. We had to lift them up and put them into their harness. I had to admit that with this temperature it would not pay to go on. The risk was too great. We therefore decided to drive on to the depot in 80 degrees south and unload our sledges there. On that day, too, we made the awkward discovery that the fluid in our compasses had frozen, rendering them useless. The weather had become very thick, and we could only guess vaguely the position of the sun. Our progress under these circumstances was very doubtful. Possibly we were on the right course, but it was just as probable, nay, more so, that we were off it. The best thing we could do, therefore, was to pitch our camp and wait for a better state of things. 
we did not bless the instrument maker who had supplied those compasses. It was 10 a.m. when we stopped. In order to have a good shelter for the long day before us, we decided to build two snow huts. The snow was not good for this purpose, but by fetching blocks from all sides we managed to put up the huts. Hansen built one and Wisting the other. In a temperature such as we now had, a snow hut is greatly preferable to a tent, and we felt quite comfortable when we came in and got the primers going. That night we heard a strange noise round us. I looked under my bag to see whether we had far to drop, but there was no sign of a disturbance anywhere. In the other hut they had heard nothing. We afterwards discovered that the sound was only due to snow settling. By this expression I mean the movement that takes place when a large extent of the snow surface breaks and sinks, settles down. This movement gives one the idea that the ground is sinking under one, and it is not a pleasant feeling. It is followed by a dull roar which often makes the dogs jump into the air, and their drivers too for that matter. Once we heard this booming on the plateau so loud that it seemed like the thunder of cannon. We soon grew accustomed to it. Next day the temperature was minus 62.5 degrees Fahrenheit, calm and perfectly clear. We did eighteen and a half miles and kept our course as well as we could with the help of the sun. It was minus 69.3 degrees Fahrenheit when we camped. This time I had done a thing that I have always been opposed to. I had brought spirits with me in the form of a bottle of Norwegian Aquavit and a bottle of gin. I thought this a suitable occasion to bring in the gin. It was as hard as flint right through. While we were thawing it, the bottle burst, and we threw it out into the snow, with the result that all the dogs started to sneeze. The next bottle, Aquavit number 1, was like a bone, but we had learned wisdom by experience, and we succeeded with care in thawing it out. We waited till we were all in our bags, and then we had one. I was greatly disappointed. It was not half so good as I had thought. But I am glad I tried it, as I shall never do so again. The effect was nil. I felt nothing, either in my head or my feet. The fourteenth was cool. The temperature remained at minus 68.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Fortunately it was clear, so that we could see where we were going. We had not gone far before a bright projection appeared on the level surface. Out with the glasses. The depot. There it lay, right in our course. Hansen, who had driven first the whole way, without a forerunner, and for the most part without a compass, had no need to be ashamed of his performance. We agreed that it was well done, and that, no doubt, was all the thanks he got. We reached it at 10.15 a.m. and unloaded our sledges at once. Wisting undertook the far from pleasant task of getting us a cup of warm milk at minus 68.8 degrees Fahrenheit. He put the primus behind one of the cases of provisions and set it going. Strangely enough, the paraffin was still liquid in the vessel, but this was no doubt because it had been well protected in the case. A cup of Horlick's malted milk tasted better that day than the last time I had tried it, in a restaurant in Chicago. Having enjoyed that, we threw ourselves on the almost empty sledges and set our course for home. The going was difficult, but with the light weight they now had to pull, the dogs went along well. I sat with Wisting, as I considered his team the strongest. The cold held on unchanged, and I was often surprised that it was possible to sit still on the sledges as we did without freezing. But we got on quite well. One or two I saw off their sledges all day, and most of us jumped off from time to time and ran by the side to get warm. I myself took to my ski and let myself be pulled along. This so-called sport has never appealed to me, but under the circumstances it was permissible. It warmed my feet, and that was the object of it. I again had recourse to this sport of ski driving later on, but that was for another reason. On the 15th, as we sat in the tent cooking and chatting, Hansen suddenly said, "'Why, I believe my heel's gone!' Off came his stockings, and there was a big dead heel, like a lump of tallow. It did not look well. He rubbed it until he thought he could feel something again, and then put his feet back in his stockings and got into his bag. Now it was Stuberud's turn. "'Blessed if I don't think there's something wrong with mine, too!' Same proceeding, same result. This was pleasant.' two doubtful heels, and forty-six miles from Framheim. When we started next morning, it was fortunately milder, almost summer, minus forty degrees Fahrenheit. It felt quite pleasant. 
the difference between minus forty degrees and minus sixty degrees is in my opinion very perceptible it may perhaps be thought that when one gets so far down a few degrees one way or the other do not make any difference but they do while driving that day we were obliged to let loose several of the dogs who could not keep up we supposed that they would follow our tracks adam and lazarus were never seen again sarah fell dead on the way without any previous symptom camilla was also among those let loose on the way home we kept the same order as on the previous days hansen and wisting as a rule were a long way ahead unless they stopped and waited we went at a tearing pace we had thought of halting at the sixteen-mile flag as we called it the mark at thirty kilometres from framheim and waiting for the others to come up but as the weather was of the best calm and clear and with our tracks on the way south perfectly plain i decided to go on the sooner we got the bad heels into the house the better the two first sledges arrived at four p m the next at six and the two following ones at six thirty the last did not come in till twelve thirty a m heaven knows what they have been doing on the way with the low temperatures we experienced on this trip we noticed a curious snow formation that i had never seen before fine extremely fine drift snow collected and formed small cylindrical bodies of an average diameter of one and a quarter inches and about the same height they were however of various sizes they generally rolled over the surface like a wheel and now and then collected into large heaps from which again one by one or several together they continued their rolling if you took one of these bodies in the hand there was no increase of weight to be felt not the very slightest if you took one of the largest and crushed it there was so to speak nothing left with the temperature in the minus forties we did not see them as soon as we came home we attended to the heels prestrud had both his heels frozen one slightly the other more severely though so far as i could determine not so badly as the other two the first thing we did was to lance the big blisters that had formed and let out the fluid they contained afterwards we put on boracic compresses night and morning we kept up this treatment for a long time at last the old skin could be removed and the new lay there fresh and healthy the heel was cured circumstances had arisen which made me consider it necessary to divide the party into two one party was to carry out the march through the south the other was to try to reach king edward the seventh land and see what was to be done there besides exploring the region around the bay of wales this party was composed of prestrud stubberud and johansen under the leadership of the first named the advantages of this new arrangement were many in the first place a smaller party could advance more rapidly than a larger one our numbers both of men and dogs on several of the previous trips had clearly shown the arrangement to be unfortunate the time we took to get ready in the morning four hours was one of the consequences of being a large party with half the number or only one tent full i hoped to be able to reduce this time by half the importance of the depots we had laid down was of course greatly increased since they would now only have to support five members of the party originally contemplated and would thus be able to furnish them with supplies for so much more time from a purely scientific point of view the change offered such obvious advantages that it is unnecessary to insist upon them henceforward therefore we worked so to speak in two parties the polar party was to leave as soon as spring came in earnest I left it to Prestrid himself to fix the departure of the party he was to lead. There was no such hurry for them. They could take things more easily. Then the same old fuss about the outfit began all over again, and the needles were busy the whole time. Two days after our return, Wisting and Bjarland went out to the thirty-kilometre mark with the object of bringing in the dogs that had been let loose on that part of the route and had not yet returned. They made the trip of sixty kilometres, thirty-seven and a half miles in six hours and brought all the stragglers ten of them back with them the farthest of them were found lying by the flag none of them showed a sign of getting up when the sledges came they had to be picked up and harnessed and one or two that had sore feet were driven on the sledges in all probability most of them would have returned in a few days but it is incomprehensible that healthy plucky dogs as many of them were should take it into their heads to stay behind like that on september twenty fourth we had the first tidings of spring when bjarland came back from the ice and told us he had shot a seal so the seals had begun to come up on to the ice this was a good sign 
The next day we went out to bring it in, and we got another at the same time. There was excitement among the dogs when they got fresh meat, to say nothing of fresh blubber. Nor were we men inclined to say no to a fresh steak. On September 27th, we removed the roof that had covered over the window of our room. We had to carry the light down through a long wooden channel so that it was considerably reduced by the time it came in. But it was light, genuine daylight, and it was much appreciated. On the 26th, Camilla came back, after an absence of ten days. She had been let loose sixty-eight miles from Framheim on the last trip. When she came in, she was as fat as ever. Probably she had been feasting in her solitude on one of her comrades. She was received with great ovations by her many admirers. On September 29th, a still more certain sign of spring appeared, a flight of Antarctic petrels. They came flying up to us to bring the news that now spring had come, this time in earnest. We were delighted to see these fine swift birds again. They flew round the house several times to see whether we were all there still, and we were not long in going out to receive them. It was amusing to watch the dogs. At first the birds flew pretty near the ground. When the dogs caught sight of them, they rushed out, the whole lot of them, to catch them. They tore along, scouring the ground, and of course all wanted to be first. Then the birds suddenly rose into the air, and presently the dogs lost sight of them. They stood still for a moment, glaring at each other, evidently uncertain of what was the best thing to do. Such uncertainty does not, as a rule, last long. They made up their minds with all desirable promptitude, and flew at each other's throats. So now spring had really arrived. We had only to cure the frostbitten heels, and then away. End of section 20. End of volume 1, chapter 9. The end of the winter. End of Volume 1